join me in prayer this morning. Lord, we come to you today. We thank you that you have given us an opportunity to come together as believers, to uh, share together in the things that we're doing today. Thank you, Lord, that here shortly we will have an opportunity to participate in the Lord's Supper. So we uh, thank you for that. And God, I am asking today that you would do what only you can do, and that is speak to the hearts of those that are here. Lord, we realize that each and every one of us are here. We are sinners. And God, I realize today that I stand here as a sinner. And Lord, I need forgiveness of my sins. And so I'm asking for forgiveness of my sins and pray that you would just place them beneath the blood of Jesus. We thank you, God, for what you have done. We thank you for what you will continue to do. I pray that you would speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I want you to leave your Bible open to this passage in Romans chapter 1. Uh, last week we were talking about a goal-oriented lifestyle, and uh, we're going to follow up on that a little bit today. When I was a young boy, a friend of mine had asked me to go to church with him, and he was a Methodist. And so he invited me to his the, the local Methodist church there. And I will never forget, as we was leaving the parking lot of the worship service uh, that day, they had a big sign facing the parking lot, so when you leave, you would see what that sign actually had to say. And the sign said this, it said, you are now entering the mission field. I asked the young man that was with me that day, I said, why do you have a sign that's backwards? Shouldn't that be the other way? And uh, the young man's father spoke up and he said, no. He said, because every Sunday when we leave this church, we want to be reminded that we are now entering the mission field that God has called us um, to serve. And folks, I want to tell you, that's true. It is a mission field when we leave this church today. It makes no difference if we are at a gas station, if we're at the grocery store, uh, whether you're at the gym working out, uh, whether you happen to be at work, or whether you're visiting one of your neighbors. When you leave here this morning, you are entering what God has called the mission field. He gave us the Great Commission, and that was to go and to spread the gospel of Christ and to tell others how Christ can change their life. Now there's a term that is used today in the modern church vernacular which is called being a missional church. The question that I want to present to you this morning is what does that mean? What does it mean for you and I as a church member and as a congregation to be a missional church? Well back in the 1990s there was a lot of research that was done on this very topic. They didn't necessarily call it a missional church but they called uh, what would be called a seeker-sensitive church. And the idea was, let's see what it is that people want in a church. So when they come, we can be everything that they want us to be and feel comfortable when they're here. Really answering that question, what is it you're seeking when you come to church? Well, I want to tell you something this morning, folks. It's not about what you're seeking when you come to church. It's about what we're doing while we're here and what we do when we leave the four walls of this church. Jesus told us very plainly that we are to go into all of the world and we are to make disciples. It's known as the Great Commission. It's the, the commandment that God has given each and every one of us. I want to submit to you today, though, this is where we have dropped the ball. Now, we're not going to point our finger at all the other Christians in the world today because they're not here. We're not even going to point the finger at all the other churches in our community today because I'm not preaching to them. I am preaching to Kennebu Baptist Church, and so this message is for me as much as it is for you today. And this is where we as a church have dropped the ball. Now listen, it's nice for us to have good sermons that encourage us and build us up, but sometimes we need more than just encouraging and build up. Sometime we need to take a state of the union, so to speak, and see where we really are at today. And I want to go back to that statement that I made, talking about the Great Commission, talking about being a missional church. This could be one of the areas that you and I as a church and as a Christian have missed the ball. Instead of employing this idea of go and do something and make disciples, We've settled for this idea of come and see. Now, I don't know that it's so much something that we specifically have done as a church, but if we can uh, spread out the, uh, move on to the outside four walls of this church, this is what you see in modern day Christianity. We as Christians are saying, here is our building. 
it's the nicest building in the community. Is there anything wrong with that? No, not necessarily. We are saying to a world, here is our worship services, and our worship services are energetic, and they're exciting, and uh, it'll just be fascinating when you come and you see our worship services. And we even have gone to the point where the focus seems to be very visual. And you say, well, wait a minute, people are, are visual. I, I get all of that, and I understand all of that. But we have this mentality of come and see. Come and see what we have to offer. Come and see what we look like. Am I saying that Sunday uh, services are not important? I'm not saying that at all. I believe this is where you should be today, and I am glad that you are here this morning. But we have forgotten one specific element of the Great Commission, and that is that you and I are specifically supposed to spread the Word of God, spread the Word of Christ, spread the Gospel, and we are to serve others in this world. Not just in this church, but outside the walls of this church as well. Uh, to put it plainly, God has called each and every one of us and placed the call upon our life to be missionaries. Have you ever heard that term? Do you know what that term means to mean that you are a missionary? Well, what does that actually mean? Well, it's not about come and see us, come and see the nice people, come and see uh, the nice building, but rather it's about let's go to them. Now listen to what I'm saying to you today because every one of us have made this mistake in our life where we have become very comfortable with who we are. We like it here. You wouldn't be here if you did not like it here, right? But we like it here. It's comfortable. We have a routine. We come in. We know we sing a couple choir songs. We may have an announcement or two. We take up our offering. The pastor gives up and he gives an excellent message. And then what happens? We sing a song and we all go home. My question for you today is, is that what God really has in store for us? Oh, that's part of corporate worship. Make no mistake about that. But is that it? Is that all that God wants for us during this time? Are we as a church, Kennebu Baptist Church, considered to be a missional church? A missional church that is made of missional people. Now, I want to tell you something. We have to ask ourselves this question because if we do not, then we just get in this rut and we become those type of churches and those type of people that just settle for the status quo. If you remember last week, I told you in the first uh, seven verses of the book of Romans chapter 1, Paul made his mission very, very clear. Paul's mission was to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles to the unbelievers, to those that did not know Christ. Now this was a driving force behind his life. In fact, it is what defined the Apostle Paul, the gospel, sharing the gospel. It defined him. It determined the influences, those that he wanted to be around and take the gospel to. But it also drove his imagination. Now that brings us to the passage today. And I'm presenting a personal question to you that I want you to ask yourself as a believer, as a Christian, would I consider myself to be missional? Well, yeah, Pastor, don't we give to the cooperative program? Don't we give to other missionary causes? Yes, that's the easy thing to do. How hard is it to open our wallet and throw out some money into an offering plate and say, here you go, missionaries, it's your job, go save the world. Well, that's not the full message that Christ had in mind, and while all of that is important, you and I have a part in this great commission as well. Our text today shows us the missionary heart of the Apostle Paul. It also tells us what it means to be missionally minded. Now, there's three things specifically about the Apostle Paul that I want you to notice, and then I think you'll see that what I'm telling you today is true, and he was without a doubt missionally focused and missionally minded. Number one, and you have this on your outline today, I want you to see this. He was consumed with the desire to minister to others. It wasn't just a choice. The Apostle Paul was consumed with this idea. 
<clears throat> his whole life revolved around helping people. Now, I want us to think this through. We are living in some of the strangest times that I have ever had in my entire life. But the truth is, when the Apostle Paul was alive, he was living in some strange times as well. Great famines had taken place. Pestilences uh, on the earth had taken place. And the Apostle Paul was about to go to Jerusalem to deliver an offering that they had collected for them from some of the other churches because many of the people in Jerusalem were hurting and they were simply poor people. And so everything he did revolved around this idea, I want to help those that are hurting. This brings us to verse 11 and verse 12 <clears throat> of our text this morning. I want you to, see, you to see this in Romans chapter 1 beginning in verse 11. Here's what the Apostle Paul says. He says, For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both you and me. Now I want to go back and I want you to realize something about this consuming desire that the Apostle Paul had. There's an important phrase in those two verses where he says that he wants them to be established. That you may be established. I want to zero in on that and I want to ask the question, what is he actually talking about there? Well, you see, Paul's desire to minister to others was not just some surface level ministry. And don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not trying to put us down as a church. I'm not trying to browbeat us. I'm trying to wake us up. That's what I'm trying to do. And I'm trying to get us to see that it's easy for all of us to fall into this surface level worship and this surface level religion. And we know what the Great Commission says, but we don't always practice what it says. Do you realize that our goal as we start a new year should not just to be to have more church members than we've ever had before? That wouldn't be bad. Most of us would say we would like some growth. But it's not just about growing a crowd and having numbers. If the Apostle Paul was standing in this pulpit today, he would give this same message. And the message is what we need is more mature believers. We need Christians that are growing. We need Christians that are searching the Scripture. We need Christians that are eagerly developing their relationship with Christ. Let's simplify it. What we need are fully devoted followers of Christ. Now's the time for a personal examination. Could you say honestly today you are a fully devoted follower of Christ? That is that if Jesus called your name today and you stood before him, would he look at you and say you are doing everything exactly the way that you should be doing it? And this is not just a message for the church. This is a message for you and I as individuals. Paul is saying, I want to establish you. I want you to be established. I want you to grow in your relationship with Christ. Now we know what Jesus has commanded of us as believers. To help the poor. To help those that are in need. To share the gospel with those that have never heard the gospel before. To reach the lost world. Folks, I want to tell you something. We will never reach the lost world if we're not willing to reach those lost that are right in front of us each and every day. That's where that starts. And if we don't have that desire, we'll never take the gospel to the rest of the world. Well, Paul continues here, and in verse 13, I want you to see what he says. He says, Now I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. Now keep this in mind, some of you are sitting here today and this is not a half-time half talk that I'm giving to you this morning, okay? Now we're not in the locker room and I'm not going to start kicking and screaming and turning over the pulpit and throwing songbooks at you, you know, telling you that you've got to do better. That's not my goal today, although sometimes I think it may be more effective than what I currently strategize. But some of you are already serving God exactly the way that you should. But there are others here today that simply need to be reminded that we need to be consistent in our walk with God. Do you know the one consistent thing that we have had this year 
in a very crazy, turbulent time of our life. Many has lost loved ones. Many has lost family members. Many have not seen as much of their family as they would have liked to. But the one consistent thing that we have in our life as a Christian is the gospel. It's the love of Christ, and it's Christ himself. He has said, I'll never leave you. I will never forsake you. It's a promise he made to his disciples, and I want to tell you, it's a promise to you and I as well. And thank goodness he has not left us or forsake us because we need him each and every day. Let's think of it this way, and it's a, it's a challenging way to think of it, especially like this. Ask yourself the question, am I closer to God today than I was last year at this time? Think back over this last year and, and just make that very personal to you. Would God look at my life right now and say, yes, this individual is living for me in a way that they never have before? If we can't answer yes to that question, then friends, what it means is we are backslidden. And even good people can be backslidden, but we all need to be reminded that we need to be missional. Now there's a second thing that I want you to notice about the Apostle Paul. First of all, he was consumed with the desire to help other people. We know that. We see that in our text. But secondly, he was compelled by a sense of responsibility. He wasn't just consumed with this idea, but Paul was compelled that this was his responsibility personally to do this. He was compelled with this idea of sharing the gospel. Look at verse 14, if you would. He said, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. Paul is saying, because of all that God has done for me, it is my obligation. I am required to do this. Can I just get a word of of testimony and response today, has God been good to you? Has God blessed you? Amen. Is God continually blessing you? What you have today, can you say, God, I owe everything I have because of your blessings on me? How many of you remember the old song, Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me? I have food on my table. I have shoes on my feet. The idea is, Lord, I have every single thing that I need, and so thank you, God, for your blessings on me. Paul understood this, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 16, Paul said it this way. He said, because of that, because of what Christ has given me, he said, woe unto me if I do not preach the gospel. Woe unto me. Think about those words that this great man of God penned that day. Woe unto me if I do not share the gospel. Why? Because of what Christ has done for me. Now, folks, I want to ask you the question, could you say that same thing? Is there anything that you could say that I am under compulsion for? Woe unto me if I do not do this because of what Christ has done for me. Let's make this a little personal today. Woe unto me because of what Christ has done for me if I don't do my part to help the children in this church learn about you. Woe unto me if... I am not involved in the life of this church because of what Christ has done for me. I say this all the time, and I, I think I say it so much it loses some of its meaning sometimes. But do you all realize that there are individuals in this church today, members of this church, that would love to be right where you're at today, but because of time and because of health, they can not make it here. They can remember a day when they were faithful and they were able to be here, but they're not able to be here today because of their health. I say this because it is so true. Every day that we wake up and God gives us the ability to be here, to worship Him, to serve Him, we ought to come with thanksgiving in our heart. We ought to come with joy in our voice. We ought to come expecting God to do something great. And we ought to say, God, I am here today because you have done so much for me. And woe unto me if I am not faithful to your house because of the blessings that you have given me. What is it, though, that drives you? What compels you to move forward in your Christian life? Well, in Acts chapter 20, in verse 24, you can jot this down. The Apostle Paul said this about himself. He said, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, 
so that I may finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus Christ to testify the gospel of the grace of God. That's what drove the Apostle Paul. And I want to tell you something. The day that you take your last breath, Nobody is going to care how many cars you own, how many houses you had, or how much money you had. The only thing that's going to matter is what you did that will last for eternity. And that is those that you shared the gospel of Christ with. Paul was compelled. Now I go back to the first point. Not only was he consumed with the gospel, he was compelled to share the gospel. But there's a third and final thing this morning. Paul was convinced of what the gospel could do. That's the third point you need to remember. Paul was convinced of what the gospel could do. Now, can I just say this in all kindness and transparency today? I think we've lost some of the awe of the gospel. I, I don't know that we really expect the gospel to do anything. We just kind of go through the routine. But listen to what Paul said in verse 16 of our text today in Romans chapter 1. He put it in a way that I don't think anyone else could. He said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. What's Paul telling us? It's the gospel of Christ. What is the gospel? The good news, the death, the burial, the resurrection, that Jesus died for our sins, that he can change our life. That is the hope for the world. Do you realize today the hope for the world is not Donald Trump, it's not Joe Biden, it's not Congress, it's not the Senate, it's not our government. And we all have opinions about that and they're fun to talk about, aren't they? I think they're fun to talk about. It keeps the world going around, right? But the truth is, there's no power in any of those things because one day, every one of those things will come to an end. But this is where Paul received his boldness. And in fact, in 2 Corinthians, he talks about being beaten. He talks about being imprisoned and even being shipwrecked. Why would the Apostle Paul subject himself to matters such as that? Not because the Apostle Paul thought the gospel was a good idea to share with the world, but he was convinced that the gospel was the only thing that could change the world. Paul knew that if he could get the gospel to people, that it would change their life. Now, I don't know if you believe this or not, but I believe that this is true. Most people don't mind sacrificing for a winning cause. But here's where the problem comes in. Many of us as Christians aren't sure that we're fighting for a winning cause anymore. Is ministry really worth it? Is the headache worth it? You teach a Sunday school class and you ask yourself, am I really doing any good? Is it worth it? Or am I just going through the motions? I teach a adult marriage Sunday school class and have the privilege to do that. I think I've been doing that for about three years now, something like that, maybe, maybe longer. And I come to this conclusion today. After all that time teaching them, I think they're more messed up now than they've ever been. <laughs> and it's often easy for me to say, what's the use? There's no hope for this bunch. I mean, what's the use? Well, what do you think the Apostle Paul would do? He was convinced that the message that he was sharing would change people's lives. And it does. We don't always see the change. Oh, we feel the hurts and we feel the pain and, and we want people to do right, but we don't always get the immediate results that we need. But you see, when a person or a church decides, I'm going to have a missional lifestyle. They soon discover it's not about being easy. It's about following the Lord's commands. And here is a command that Christ has given us that all of us can follow. Doesn't he give us some commands sometimes and we think, well, I don't know how I'm going to do on this one or I missed the mark on that one. Here's a command that all of us can fully follow if we will commit ourselves to, and it is the command of the Great Commission to be missionaries 
to be missional, to leave here today, and when you leave, to say, I am a missionary for the Lord. I am on the mission field. In fact, in just a few moments, we're going to sing a song. We're going to participate in the Lord's Supper. We're going to have some prayers. We will sing a closing hymn. We will depart. We will shake hands. But when you step out from underneath that canopy this morning on your way to your vehicle and that sun beams down on your face, I want you to remember something. You are entering the mission field. You are to fulfill the great commission that God has called you to do. Now there may be barriers in your life right now that you need to deal with and you need to say, I, I, I can't be a good missionary right now. My life is a mess. <laughs> then this is the time and this is the place that you need to deal with that. And I want to encourage you to take a self-evaluation of your own life. But can we as a church come together and agree that we are going to be missional? We are going to fulfill the Great Commission. Will you make that commitment with me?